Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, our reproductive futures and how we can shape these uh, using speculative design. Um, yeah, so it's a critical conversation to have to talk about our reproductive futures, especially looking at the recent setbacks that we've seen in reproductive um, health rights, such as the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the US last year. Um, it's important, especially with these kind of situations, to look ahead and think about uh, our values and the social justice we want to uphold in our reproductive futures. So my name is Lisa Mandemaker, and I am a speculative designer focused on creating um, inv um, invitations on, to reflect on possible futures. Um, I do this uh, together with scientists, with industry, uh, philosophers, researchers, and we make these potential futures tangible so that we can talk about it with a broad range of people to see how we feel about it and what is preferable and what not. So um, has anyone ever heard about speculative design here in the room? Oh, quite many. There's a few. Um, so speculative design is quite a niche uh, design practice. Um, it's uh, founded in traditional design practices, such as product, product design or architecture. Uh, it moves on to like more critical design practices and then ended into speculative design. Uh, speculative design is more an approach than a method, and it kind of, yeah, searches to redefine the conditions in which we practice design. Um, it's about imagining uh, potential futures and looking um, and trying to find alternative ways of thinking and doing. I usually use this um, uh, diagram to explain where speculative design lives. It's a diagram of uh, different cones fanning out in, into the future. Um, the probable cone, the, the smallest cone, is uh, where uh, most designers operate. It's what's most likely to happen in the future. The plausible future um, is where scenario planning and trend watching lives. And the possible future, the biggest cone, this is where speculative design exists. And the interesting cone is the one that intersects all three of them, which is the preferable future. And that is an interesting future to explore um, because what is, who decides what is preferable and um, what is preferable for one individual or community is maybe not as preferable for someone else. So that's where uh, speculative design comes in to make different uh, a plur plurality of alternative futures tangible so that we can discuss together what is preferable and what not. So moving on to the future of reproduction, um, in this uh, space of the discussion about our um, reproductive futures, um, artificial wombs become more and more a part of this discussion. Artificial womb technology is also known as ectogenesis technology, and it's a technology that allows for fetuses to grow outside of the human body. The first working artificial womb is this one. Uh, it's made by the Philadelphia Children's Hospital in 2017. Um, here's a sheep at the um, equivalent of 22 to 24 weeks gestation, uh, human gestation. Um, and this is also where this technology is, is heading towards to um, increase the survival rate of extremely prematurely born babies. Outside of these labs, um, there's also a lot of discussion going on um, about artificial wombs um, and different scenarios circulate. Um, most of these scenarios um, kind of capitalize on the idea that ectogenesis can be used to solve the fertility crisis and can be used for human enhancement. Um, and one of these um, concept videos you still see is still um, of that video behind me of the ectolife facility. Um, I think these kinds of scenarios are a bit um, problematic uh, because they picture um, a really gloomy sci-fi scenario of what ectogenesis could be. Um, whereas I think we could think about it in a really different way. So that is what I uh, do in my practice. Um, I try to look at it in an uh, alternative way, um, not yeah, looking be beyond human enhancement and have more these post-human values instead of the transhumanist values. 
So how I do this, I'd like to illustrate with a couple of uh, projects that I did to um, show you what I mean. Um, this is one of the first projects uh, that I worked on, um, which uh, was quite successful. Um, this is a speculative prototype of how an artificial womb could look like in the future. I worked on this with the Maxima Medical Center in uh, Eindhoven, which is a hospital. And they are working on, they are one of the, the research groups um, all over the world that are working uh, on developing this um, artificial womb technology. Uh, they are not working with sheep, but um, um, with mannequins, but they're focusing on making this um, work for human babies. Um, our brief was to design something tangible um, to show how such a technology could look like in our everyday lives um, and how a device like that even like, could possibly look like. Um, and in my uh, design practice, uh, in my design process, um, I came across this image, which I thought was really interesting. I was looking at different ways how uh, people have imagined um, uh, artificial wombs over the years. And this is, I'm gonna skip to the next. <laughs> um, and, but I, what I liked about that last image, uh, it's an incubator display uh, from the eight, late 1800s. And what I really liked about this image was the palm trees that they chose to present it with. I thought that was a really intriguing choice. Um, so that was also, uh, that was what we centered on with our um, uh, concept for the artificial womb. Um, uh, we were looking at images as pumpkin fields or botanical gardens, which are also cultivated spaces where growth takes place. So why not, instead of uh, making it a really medical scenario, make it much more um, like this kind of nursery of the, of the future? Um, and we combined that with the research of the, um, of the, uh, of the hospital, and we presented that at the Dutch Design Week in Eindhoven. And I was actually um, really de that depending on uh, the public at the Dutch Design Week being very critical about this type of technology. Uh, because when I was working on this um, and there wasn't anything tangible to show yet, I got very strong reactions of why are you working on such a technology? Um, so I was expecting uh, people to react in that way, but with this tangible um, installation that people could walk around on and point things, uh, point things out, um, it helped to get the conversation more into the gray area instead of these polarized discussion, like pro or against artificial wombs. Uh, the conversations were more about why is this not see-through or how do I connect with the baby inside? Like these are questions about values and interactions that we can use to um, influence how it's designed in the future. Um, another project that I wanted to show um, is um, uh, an IVF ritual. This, this uh, project was called Lab Romanticism. Um, I went to the uh, fertility clinic to do my research and um, the, um, the IVF process is usually seen as quite clinical and detached. So I wanted to give these aspiring parents that were going through this IVF process, um, something tangible and meaningful to um, do together as a shared experience during the last days of the IVF process. So this follows um, the kind of the first steps of the embryo during the conception in the clinic where you are not a part of, so that it kind of yeah, creates this meaningful little ritual that you could do at home together. The last um, project that I wanted to show is uh, Monuments for Future Mother Otherhood. Um, this is um, the installation that I did last year and also presented at the Dutch Design Week. Um, this is a scenario that is set in 2050. It's an immersive speculative um, installation uh, in a, set in a future where pregnancy takes place completely outside of the human body. And in this scenario, when you're born from an artificial womb, at your 18th birthday, you'll get an invite um, to um, come and visit this monument that um, exhibits a part of your artificial womb that you've been gestated in. So it's kind of 
uh, a future genealogy department to be able to connect to um, yeah, the device that gave you life, but maybe also connect to children that were born from the same device. Um, it's actually kind of a paradigm shift on how we could think about artificial motherhood. And um, central in this whole um, concept was uh, a speculative life cycle timeline that we um, came up with for a speculative artificial womb. So after being produced, an artificial womb gestates one baby per year for 18 years. And after 18 years, it goes into retirement and becomes this monument um, that, um, yeah, that becomes this place for visitation and connection and how we could rethink um, like our connection to these devices and family. So in this concept, the, the artificial womb is at its end of its life cycle. And uh, instead of thinking about making a working artificial womb, we were more looking at what can these, this artificial womb um, mean in new relationships that we could build um, instead of these medical uh, scenarios. And we decided to put the uh, monuments in, an, in a fictional ecosystem of, of plants, flowers, and fungi. And these um, mushrooms are meant as a narration device to go into this future scenario. And when you put on the mushroom head, the artificial womb will talk to you through the fungi and welcomes you as one of the 18-year-olds that were born from that artificial womb. Um, it's also designed to impede the vision of the wearer so um, that you can really focus on the narration. So with these type of projects, uh, like the, the prototype and the monuments, what I really want, want to achieve is to redesign the narratives and meaning um, around these reproductive technologies and help, um, and maybe it could help us to navigate the ethical and the social and the cultural implications of these types of technologies. Um, because a lot of the um, socially constructed concepts that we now have around motherhood, fertility, and, and reproduction as a whole um, influence its future reality. So by redesigning these concepts and thinking more um, in a way of uh, like a perspective of care, instead of a perspective of power and mastering something through technology. These speculative prov provocation um, kind of create community engagement um, and also shift the societal debates. And eventually the uh, qualitative data that we collect at these exhibition sites give us insights to come back and to, to the present and to influence how these new technologies are imagined and how these new technologies are designed so that all of our values are embedded um, in these uh, technologies. Um, yeah, so if you're working in anything related to reproduction or menstruation, I'm open to new collaborations. Um, and yeah, to conclude, um, let us embrace speculative design to enable more meaningful uh, conversations about these uh, technologies and yeah to design a preferable future for everyone thank you very much